Hi folks and welcome to unit three lesson two. So let's just recall that in our last lesson um, we saw how there was a relationship between the sign of the derivative and the increasing and decreasing nature of a function. So we found that when the derivative was positive on an interval that function was uh, increasing on that interval and when the derivative was negative it was decreasing on that interval. Okay, and we had to tweak uh, things a little, and we were able to come up with a um, an algorithm to determine uh, the intervals of uh, increase and decrease of a function. So what we're going to do today is we're going to look at how uh, to determine local extrema, which we know is one of those things that we were missing from our last course. I think a lot of what we find in this um, lesson is not going to be surprising, but again, I think we're going to see that we're going to need to tweak things a little. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to ask you to do is to observe these two functions. And uh, on Desmos, you'll graph both the function and its derivative. And I want you to try to determine a relationship between uh, the places where the function has a local extremum and the beha behavior of the derivative there. And then from there, try to come up with that relationship and then write um, an algorithm for determining the local extrema based on what we're seeing in these examples here. Okay, so I'm going to ask you to please stop the video at this point, uh, finish numbers one, two, and three, and then we'll come back and take a look. So please stop the video now. Okay, we're back. So let's uh, take a look at what we found. So we're going to take a look at these two graphs. Okay, we have them here. So if we take a look at that first function, and we notice that it has... Uh, local extrema here, just a little before 0.2, and uh, just a little uh, at around 1.2. Okay, now let's just sketch the graph of the derivative and see what we see. We see that something very interesting happens, that at those two x values, the uh, derivative is equal to zero. Okay, now not too surprising because at these local extrema, it makes perfect sense that the slope of the tangent is equal to zero. So I don't think this is too surprising, uh, something we'd noticed before. So if we take a look at the uh, other function as an example, so again here, it looks like we've got two local extrema, a min and a max. And if we plot the derivative, we see, well, in this area where there seems to be a max, again, derivative is zero, and here where there's a min, derivative is zero. Okay, so perfectly reasonable based on what we've seen in the past. Okay, so what relationship seems to exist? Well, right, um, you know, the local extrema occur when the derivative is equal to zero. Okay, and why does the assertion make sense? Okay, since the graph has a horizontal tangent at those points, has a horizontal tangent at those points. Okay, so you notice here I'm giving my answer in point form, perfectly fine to use shorthand, so type of thing you might want to do in a communication question. All right, so it says based on your results in two, how would you determine the local extrema of the function? Okay, so again, if I'm coming up with an algorithm, so step number one is find the derivative of a function, and then step number two, determine the x values where the derivative is equal to zero, and then number three, those x values are the local extrema. All right, so based on what we saw, this seems to be correct. But hopefully you're seeing right off the bat that there's something missing here because not only do I want to know where the local extrema occur, I really want to know whether it's a local max or a local min. All right, so that's definitely uh, something we're going to need to uh, view uh, and try to determine how we can figure that out. So what I'm going to ask you to do is look at these examples here, okay, doing the same thing. Notice here I'm asking you to set the y values to a different uh, um, uh, to a different scale so that you can see it nicely. And hopefully looking at these examples might actually fine-tune what you wrote, 
All right, but notice that in number five, okay, because I want you to do numbers four and five now, I want you to look specifically for those conditions that are going to produce a local maximum or a local minimum. All right, um, so at this point here, like I said, we're going to do that fine tuning, and then what I'd like you to do is write out a more accurate algorithm uh, for finding local extrema. All right, so I'm going to ask you to stop the video now and finish off numbers four and five. All right, we're back. So let's take a look at uh, these three functions and see if they help us um, uh, fine tune our algorithm that we uh, conjectured in number three. All right, so let's take a look at these functions. So if I take a look at x to the two thirds, right? And the one thing I notice here is that, while well, there's definitely a local min at zero, but I'm pretty sure that there's gonna be something a little different with this derivative. So if we just plot the derivative and we see that the derivative is not equal to zero at zero, okay? We actually have vertical asymptote, so the derivative doesn't exist. So what this tells us is right off the bat, we need to look a little further from what we said before. We said before that if the derivative was going to be equal to zero, we'd have a local extremum, okay, which this doesn't disprove that, but it shows us that there's other places where we're going to look for those local extrema, okay? And this is makes sense because here this function is not actually differentiable at zero. It's got a cusp. It has no tangent, and so obviously no tangent means no derivative, all right? So let's move on. If we take a look at x cubed, and it's a function we know very well, and we take a look at its derivative, well, we see that the derivative is equal to zero at zero, yet I do not have a local extremum there, okay? So when I look at the red function, I see that it makes perfect sense that the derivative is zero because the tangent seems to be horizontal, yet I don't have um, a local extremum. So that tells me that the derivative being equal to zero doesn't guarantee a local extremum. And again, I don't think that's too surprising based on what we've seen in the past, all right? So let's take a look at that last example. Okay, so here I did say that uh, we should change this to uh, negative 10 to 100. Okay, and we're seeing a little more information here. And again, I'm seeing up, uh, this looks like this is gonna be uh, a horizontal tangent, yet I'm not gonna get uh, a local extremum there, okay? And if we plot this function, we see that, all right, local extremum, derivative is equal to zero, all right? But derivative is equal to zero, not necessarily a local extremum. All right, so what have we gotten so far? We've gotten that we're still looking for where the derivative is equal to zero, okay? But we also have to look at where the derivative doesn't exist, all right? We're also seeing that a derivative um, equal to zero doesn't necessarily guarantee a local maximum or minimum. And speaking of local maximum or minimum, let's see if we can figure out um, what makes it a max and what makes it a min. And one thing that I notice, and I'll take this example, is I notice here that there's an x-intercept at that value, but the function actually crosses the x-axis, whereas here, the function doesn't cross the x-axis. It stays the same sign on the other side. And hey, yet again, the sign of a function seems to be important for us. And I think that makes sense, because if I look at a local min, what well, means the function has to be decreasing to the left of that value and increasing to right of that value, okay? In fact, and if you look at the slopes of the tangents, all negative to the left, all positive to the right. So it looks like in order to have a local minimum, not only do you have to have a scenario where, in this case here, the derivative is equal to zero, but the derivative actually has to change sign, and it has to change from negative to positive. In other words, the function has to go from decreasing to increasing. Whereas here, the derivative is still zero, but I notice the sign does not change. Increasing and still increasing. So positive 
but then remains positive after that zero. Okay, let's take a look at some of the other examples to see if we can, uh, so let's take a look at this one here. All right, the first one. All right, let's go back to our regular scale. And what do we have? So again, we have a local minimum. Okay, and what do we see? The function goes from decreasing to increasing. So in other words, from a negative derivative to a positive derivative. Okay, there has to be a change of sign. Now let's take a look at an example where there's a maximum. Okay, and if we look here, there's a maximum around this point. And what happens? The function has to go from increasing to decreasing. So in other words, from positive to negative. The derivative has to go from positive to negative. Okay, so now we can write out an algorithm that not only helps us determine where we have an extremum, but whether it's a local maximum or minimum. Okay, so let's write that out here. So let's see what they say. So determine the conditions that must be satisfied in order for there to be a local extremum. So we saw that the derivative could be zero or the derivative might not exist. All right. And when it comes to specifying the condition for a local max or min, well, a local max has to go from increasing to decreasing. In other words, positive derivative to negative derivative. And a local minimum has to go from decreasing to increasing. So negative derivative to positive derivative. And what we're going to write out here, this algorithm, is called the first derivative test. Now, you might say, huh, that seems odd. Why are we, uh, uh, why are we specifying first derivative test? Well, I'll leave that for you to think about. Okay, so again, algorithm, we have to be very specific about our steps. So step number one is find the derivative. All right, step number two, and again, this is all going to seem very familiar. Uh, you're going to find uh, x such that f at f prime of x is equal to zero or does not exist. Okay, so already we're fine tuning our uh, previous algorithm. All right, then number three, well, you have to test the intervals for the sign of f prime created by these x values. Okay, test signs of intervals created by step two, okay, where it's equal to zero does not exist. All right, now here, this is where we have to be careful because let's say you have a function, say f, has a vertical asymptote. Well, f doesn't exist at zero, so neither will its derivative, okay? So even though you might have a change of sign, okay? So here we see that, you know, in this case here we don't, but let's say we had something like this, they change from positive to negative, you don't actually have an extremum at zero because the function doesn't exist there, okay? So when we're using our points in our interval, we're only using those points where the function exists, okay? So if f prime goes from positive to negative, okay, what happens? So increasing to decreasing, then we have f has a local max, okay? positive to negative, increasing to decreasing. And if F prime goes from negative to positive, then X has a local min, okay? Because if the goes from negative, so the function is decreasing to increasing, okay? And then as a little caveat here, you can only have local extrema where the function exists. Okay, so if you have a change in sign, uh, that won't necessarily be a local extremum if the function doesn't exist there. And an example there would be something with a vertical asymptote. 
Okay, so now we're starting to see that we're developing those tools to find those missing pieces of information uh, when we were trying to sketch the graphs of functions in our previous course. All right, so there's going to be a second video that's going to go through number six. So you should be working on these here, and the next video will take up the questions from number six. Okay, so just to recap, this first derivative test gives us a way to determine local extrema, but not only the local extrema, it also allows us to determine whether these local extrema are maximum or minimum. Okay, that's it for this.